I'm Bill Curtis. People who have suffered physical or psychological abuse say that they often feel an overwhelming sense of fear and hopelessness and are unable to imagine any way out of their predicament. In certain cases, however, the abuse crosses some invisible line, unknown perhaps even to the victim, and the results can be deadly. When the residents of Ludowisi, Georgia, discovered that one of their own had been murdered, it was the beginning of a story that would reveal the most intimate details of a family's dark past and divide the loyalties of a small town. In the end, a jury would be forced to decide just how much one person can take. Just outside Helena, Georgia, 23-year-old Billy Crowder sits in a medium security state penitentiary. He is serving a life sentence for armed robbery and manslaughter. The victim? The man who raised him, his own grandfather. While Billy Crowder freely admits to the murder, he claims that his grandfather had abused him for years and one day just went too far. I was killing him. I don't regret it. I mean, how long after all I've seen, everything he's done to me, and I mean, it don't bother me. Though he is now behind bars, Crowder says his life, in many ways, is better than the one he had before. Prison, you know, nobody wants to be locked up, but I am safe here. I don't get beat here. You know, it's, it's much better than my life was out there. I mean, I don't walk around in fear every day. How could prison be better than the life he left behind? Some say a small Georgia town held that secret until it was too late. Billy Crowder's story begins some 50 miles south of Savannah, along a flat stretch of US Highway 301 in the town of Ludowisi. With a population of 1,600, the town is little more than a stopover for passing motorists. Those who call Ludowisi home have always known it as a peaceful, tight-knit community. It's one of those places where you can't help but know everybody's business the trick is not to appear to be intruding into it. It's uh, like a lot of other small towns in Georgia. Most of the local people tend to stay with their own, own kind and maybe are a little less trusting of outsiders. Long County Sheriff Cecil Nobles, in office for nearly 30 years, is considered by many to be the most influential person in town. We're talking about an old-fashioned conservative community where the sheriff is still one of the most powerful political figures in the community. You still have, to a large extent, the good old boy network, and I have always took that to mean the sheriffs, who are the most powerful law enforcement people in most rural counties. And if you, you know, are in, then you're in, and if you're out, then you're out, and you better watch out. 64-year-old Thurman Martin, a mechanic and former truck driver, was said to be well-connected to the sheriff and enjoyed the benefits of being a town insider. Thurman Martin was a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, uh, take care of things kind of man for people in the town. He had a reputation of doing that. He also had a reputation of being very violent, very violent. In 1997, Martin was a widower, living in a one-story converted church with his two grandchildren, 19-year-old Billy Crowder and Billy's sister, Katie, who was 18. Their mother lived in a trailer with her husband behind the Martin home. Thurman Martin made a point of running a disciplined household, controlling nearly every aspect of his grandchildren's lives. He was a very dominating man. He was a controller. He wanted his family to tremble in his presence. Uh, they didn't do anything unless he okayed it. He was strict from, uh, you know, 
from all indication uh, of seeing him and, and, and knowing him. Uh, maybe he was too strict, I don't know. Thurman was just Thurman, uh, you know, and he, he had his way. Willie Edward Crowder. To outsiders, it seemed that Martin's firm hand had yielded good results. Billy and Katie excelled in their studies. Billy had graduated high school and was taking courses at a local technical college. While Billy worked in his grandfather's garage, his sister Katie's place was in the home. She stayed in the house and cooked and cleaned. She'd get up about 5.36 and cook a full breakfast in the morning time, and then she'd cook supper that night. You'd see them going and coming to school and, you know, things of that nature. Uh, I never had any dealings with them uh, as far as them being in any trouble or anything of that nature. Then on May 19th, 1997, the Sheriff's Department received a phone call from Billy Crowder. He said his grandfather, Thurman Martin, had gone missing. The Sheriff, as was standard practice, brought the Georgia Bureau of Investigation into the case. They didn't yet have any reason to suspect foul play. The family had related to law enforcement that some clothing was missing, which appeared that he may have uh, left on his own accord. So at that particular time, there was no massive manhunt for Thurman. Three days later, Deputy Chief of Police Sonny Shambliss visited the Martin House for some follow-up questioning. He stumbled onto an unusual scene. They was all dancing. There were several of them there. Katie was there, and some boys was there. All of them, they was just basically having a party. Something wasn't right. They was too happy. That's when I felt like they knew something about it. But it was just a hunch, and police continued to treat the disappearance as a missing persons case. Three more weeks went by with no sign of Martin. Then on June 10th, 39-year-old Diane Crowder Stanton, Martin's daughter and the mother of Billy and Katie, surprised authorities with a shocking allegation. She claimed that her father had raped her on multiple occasions. Police were suspicious of the timing of the accusation. And it led them to speculate that Martin's family might have been involved in his disappearance. Each member of the Martin clan was called in for individual questioning. Initially, when we were trying to put the pieces together, if this was a missing persons case, if this was a criminal act involved at all, Billy was asked if there was any abuse whatsoever, and he said no. Well, if I told him that, then that'd give me a motive for killing him, so I denied it. We kept digging, and one thing would come out, uh, and then that's when Jason Jordan came into play. 17-year-old Jason Jordan was a friend of Billy's from the nearby town of Jessup, Georgia. I knew Billy for about a year. I met him through some other friends in town. Just really somebody, you know, I just talked to and hung around with every once in a while. Just after Thurman Martin disappeared in May 1997, Jordan drove to North Carolina to visit his family. One night after drinking all evening, Jordan told his brother that he had witnessed a murder back in Ludowisi. I broke down and, and kind of told a story. I told him what happened there, and I didn't know if he believed me or not, you know. Jordan's family was concerned by his tale of murder, and they alerted police. The authorities in North Carolina called the GBI and said, hey, have you got anybody, somebody missing down in Long County area? And they said, well, like, yeah. Georgia authorities brought Jason Jordan back to Ludowisi. And on June 30th, he agreed to take a polygraph test regarding his possible involvement in Thurman Martin's disappearance. Jordan failed and quickly confessed that he, in fact, had been involved in murdering the Martin family patriarch. Jordan claimed he participated under the direction of Billy Crowder and that the rest of Crowder's family was also involved. His stepfather, John Stanton, his mother, Diane, and his sister, Katie. Police next approached Billy Crowder and requested he take a polygraph test as well. Billy also failed, and police pressed him to talk. They kept on, kept on. Ah, oh, we know you did it, we know you did it. Where is he? I don't know what you're talking about. 
After repeated questioning, though, an exasperated Billy made a fatal slip, blurting out, quote, I didn't kill him with no rifle. As no mention of a weapon had yet been made, Billy realized he had given himself away. So I said, well, there's one of two ways I go. This I keep saying I didn't do it, probably get death sentence, or I could turn around tell the truth and hopefully something will come out of it. It was then, even though he had not yet been arrested, that Billy gave a voluntary confession to murdering his grandfather, saying that he, John Stanton, and Jason Jordan had shot and killed him in his sleep. He made a remark in his statement that he gave me that he had been wanting to kill him since he was six years old. On July 3rd, 1997, Billy Crowder and Jason Jordan were arrested. Billy's stepfather, John Stanton, also confessed to his role in the murder. But while their crime was shocking, their justification for it was even more so. Soon, long-held secrets would emerge, secrets that some argued had driven an entire family to kill one of its own. In July 1997, in Ludowisi, Georgia, 19-year-old Billy Crowder confessed to killing his grandfather, Thurman Martin. Also indicted for the murder were his stepfather, John Stanton, and friend, Jason Jordan. Hal Peel, a local defense attorney, was appointed to represent Crowder. At first, it seemed he wouldn't have much to work with. This was the case of, uh, you know, they wanted to kill him, they killed him, and they were glad. They were very glad that he was dead. But when Peel first met with Crowder, he heard stories of a long history of abuse within the Martin family. Once I was told that, then I, at least I had a heads up and I was able to go and, uh, and discuss it with the family. As Peel began delving further into these allegations, the media consumed by the drama of the case followed close behind. Once we started looking around to talk with neighbors, it was amazing to me how the whole story of abuse had just spread like wildfire. What kind of man would you say Mr. Martin was? He was strict. He was abusive from my point of view because, like I said, I've seen him over here at the shop with Billy. He beat him in the face. He stood there and he would cuss him. And the, the child never picked up his arm or fist or even hit him back. To attorney Hal Peel, the story taking shape was not one of cold-blooded murder, but instead something closer to justifiable homicide. Peel realized this was the lifeline his client desperately needed. We had a recent Georgia Supreme Court opinion that gave us a jury charge on being a battered person uh, as being a valid defense. The attorney hired psychologist Daniel Grant, an expert on domestic abuse, to interview members of the Martin family. His initial findings painted a grim picture of the grandfather. Thurman Martin was not a nice man. He, according to the family, was very abusive towards the children for, for more than one generation. The abuse, Grant was told, had begun years earlier, when Billy Crowder's mother, Diane, was a child. She was subject to both physical, emotional, uh, and sexual abuse you know, throughout her life. She talked about multiple occasions where her father would take liberties with her. By the age of 19, the abuse had taken its toll on Diane, leading to struggles with drug addiction and mental illness. In 1979, Diane finally moved out of the house and gave birth to her first child. Billy. For reasons no one ever understood, Martin immediately took the child from Diane and raised him as his own. Billy never spent a night in the home with his mother. Thurman took him and he let Diane know that she would never have him. And if Thurman said, you're going to do it this way, then it was going to be done that way if you wanted to live. According to Billy, as he grew older, he soon experienced his grandfather's abuse for himself. He says most of the beatings occurred in the workshed, 
next to the house. He just slapped me and kicked me and punched me. He made wrenches, hammers, welding rods, fan belts, water hoses. Just whatever was enormous reach. Sometimes he's like being around the devil. Uh, barbaric, ruthless, uh, compassionless, compassionate lists, uh, emotionless, cold. Billy grew up feeling like a zombie. You don't see feelings and emotions when you look into his eyes. They're distant. It's like he's not there. Uh, and this is, you know, very common in people that have had years of abuse and never allowed to have feelings or emotions. By all accounts, the only nurturing influence in Billy's life was his grandmother, Lula Kate. She was a good mother to them. She was just a very weak-minded woman, a very confused and controlled woman. In addition to Billy's own beatings, he claimed he had to endure the side of his grandmother being abused as well. By 1991, Lula Kate, suffering from lung cancer, had become too ill to manage the household chores. When she could not do for Thurman and prepare his meals and do what was to be done, then Katie was gone and gotten. And then Katie turned into the slave. Billy's younger sister, 12 years old at the time, had been living with their mother, Diane, and her husband, John Stanton, in the nearby town of Brunswick. Thurman Martin told his 39-year-old daughter to send Katie to him, and she obeyed. Just as Diane yielded to his demands, Billy and Katie also claimed they felt powerless against their grandfather. He always was threatening the family, and he would tell them if anyone told of the abuse, you know, then he would kill the rest of them. Or if they left, he would find them and, and kill them. You couldn't leave. I mean, we left so many times for it. He'd come out there and basically put a gun to our head and say, if you don't come back, I key. If you ever leave again, I key. Plus, I had my sister there with me, and I just couldn't leave her with him. Nor, Billy says, could he tell anyone about the situation. The reason he claims is that his grandfather was too well connected. Some neighbors around town knew about it, and some of his old buddies from years ago, they all knew about it, but nobody never said anything about it. And, I mean, ever since I was about 13, I've talked about killing him. They just always say, nah, you ain't gonna do that. You're just talking crazy. Later, a neighbor claimed he alerted the sheriff's office to the abuse. Sheriff Cecil Nobles, however, denied any knowledge of this. We did not have any reports of the children being abused whatsoever. And I checked with the local police department in Louisville, they did not have a report there where he had abused his grandchildren. When American Justice requested an interview with Sheriff Nobles, he declined. In February 1997, Billy and Katie's only comfort, their grandmother Lula Kate, died of lung cancer. Shortly afterwards, Katie, terrified of her grandfather, begged her mother Diane to move into a trailer on the Martin property. Diane agreed, but the relationship of incest and abuse that had existed between her and her father apparently resumed. I went to their house to check on the family, and Diane and her father were dancing cheek to cheek in the living room. It was a couple of days later. Diane told me that Thurman had her doing all things that a wife does. Diane's husband, John Stanton, had also come to live in the trailer. The frail 58-year-old would later say that he knew of the abuse heaped on his wife and was subjected to physical attacks himself from the much stronger Martin. According to the family, Martin soon began threatening Katie as well. Mr. Martin, on the weekends when he would drink, he started uh, making advances towards Katie. He started treating Katie as if uh, she was next. Another three months went by, and for the entire family, life under Thurman Martin's roof was approaching a breaking point. On the afternoon of May 18th, 
Billy had just finished waxing his grandfather's car when Martin discovered he had mistakenly used the wrong kind of wax. The result was a brutal thrashing. He sat there and beat me and busted my nose and mouth. I had blood all down my T-shirt and all, and he just kept on beating me and finally said, you know, you're never going to mount nothing like that bitch of a grandma you had. And it's just like a dog. You beat him every day, and sooner or later, he's going to turn on you. Later that night, Billy, with the help of his stepfather, John Stanton, and friend Jason Jordan, would kill Thurman Martin. In May of 1997, in Ludowisi, Georgia, 19-year-old Billy Crowder's life was about to change forever. Following years of alleged physical and emotional abuse from his grandfather, Thurman Martin, Crowder claims he had reached the end of his rope. Ten weeks, I was graduating from college. I then had a job at Ford Motor Company lined up. I'd had means to be out of it. I'd finished my school, but uh, I don't know, just something happened that night. On the evening of May 18th, soon after Crowder says he received a brutal beating from his grandfather, he made a phone call to his friend, Jason Jordan. About five, I called Jason up, and I said, hey, man, I got a job for us to do. He said, what is it? I said, uh, you know what it is. He said, all right. The plan being hatched was one of murder. The evening of the crime, Billy and his sister Katie, as usual, ate dinner with their grandfather. Afterwards, Billy went to his room, cleaned his guns, and waited for Martin to go to bed. Finally, he went to sleep. I saw him go in his room. I went out and picked the guns up and put them in the car, went pick Jason up. When Billy and Jason returned, they met up with Billy's stepfather, John Stanton, who also agreed to participate. Inside Stanton's trailer, several guns were distributed. After Billy and Jason changed into military attire, all three men approached the Martin house. Billy entered alone through a back window, then let Jason and John in the front door. We went to the kitchen counter. All the rounds said, oh, y'all ready for this? They said, yes. I said, you sure? I said, once you do this, there's no turning back. They said, oh, we know. Leaving Jason in the kitchen, Billy and John, guns drawn, crept softly towards Martin's bedroom. Billy entered first. I went in the room there and pulled the trigger. His automatic rifle, so one clip ended a couple seconds. So as I seen the first two or three bullets hit the back of his head and his skull opened up. That's whenever I realized what I'd done. I mean, I knew what I was doing. Nobody was gonna stop me from doing it. But that's when I realized, hey, I just killed somebody. After Billy fired his gun, John Stanton, as agreed, took a turn shooting Martin. And then John called me to the door, tried to get the gun to meet it. He said, uh, you gotta shoot him too, so that way you'll be down with everything. And I told him, I said, ain't no way I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot him. Thurman Martin, though, was already dead, and the three conspirators began the cleanup. Four blood started pouring out, wrapping up a couple bags, tied them up shower curtains, and we carried him outside and dug a hole. While Stanton stood by, Crowder and Jordan dug the makeshift grave and buried Martin in his own front yard. The men then devised a story to tell authorities. Their plan was to make it appear as though Martin had left town on his own. He wouldn't lift his glasses on his wallet and everything. So I took and grabbed the pants and glass everything, threw in the bag, and I felt the wallet and I was staying. Inside the wallet, Billy Crowder found $600 in cash, which he later used to pay bills and buy groceries. Afterwards, John Stanton went back to his trailer, and Billy drove Jason home. When Billy at last returned, it was nearly 6 a.m. He took a shower, and for the first time in years, he says, had a restful sleep. I felt safe then, had no more worries. Didn't worry about if I was gonna die that day or the next day or when. Uh, well, safe, I guess, is the main thing. Both Billy's mother, Diane, and his sister, Katie, say they learned about the murder later that morning. 
and willingly pitched in to help clean up the crime scene. Diane and Katie, they was cleaning the house with bleach and everything, trying to hide evidence, and uh, I think they found some shells on the floor, and, and they stripped his bed down and everything. Billy then noticed a final glaring detail that needed attention. I'm looking outside there through the window, and I see this big old huge hole out there, or freshly turned earth, and it like got grave you know, written all over. I was like, oh no. Billy immediately drove to pick up Jason, and the two of them went searching for something that would hide the fresh grave. Their first and only stop was a garden supply store. Found some tomato plants, it's about two and a half foot high. They had tomatoes on them about the size of a quarter. And it was perfect, it was just like a regular garden. When Billy Crowder gave his account of the murder to police, he was not entirely forthcoming with this part of the story. Well, actually, I never did tell him where to bury him. Uh, I said, you don't know where he's at, go rent the movie The Last Supper. You know where he's at. The 1995 film features a group of young friends who murder unsuspecting dinner guests and then bury them in a backyard tomato garden. On July 3rd, the same day as Billy's confession, detectives screened the film, then went to the Martin property where they discovered the tomato patch. Police then brought in a backhoe and began digging. Working in the afternoon sun, with the temperature topping 100 degrees, investigators exhumed the body of Thurman Martin. He was wrapped in a shower curtain. He had plastic bags on his head. The yellow nylon rope, as was described to us, was also there. After weeks of searching of the- Dal Kennedy, a reporter who had covered Martin's disappearance, was there at the scene. The body had been buried less than 50 feet from the house. You would think the body would have been found miles away in some remote place, maybe out in the woods or something, but that it was so close by was what was really eerie about it. Almost a year after Thurman Martin's body was discovered, Jason Jordan was tried for his role in the crime. The jury took only 18 minutes to find him guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Billy's sister Katie and their mother Diane both admitted to helping conceal the murder. In return, they each received only a short prison sentence and probation. Prosecutors now went to work on their case against Billy Crowder and John Stanton, which they maintained was simple, cold-blooded murder. The defense, however, was busy gathering witnesses who would testify to the years of abuse the family had been subjected to, and in so doing, try to sway the jury that this was, in fact, a justifiable homicide. In June of 1998, in Ludowisi, Georgia, Billy Crowder and his stepfather, John Stanton, were about to stand trial for murder and armed robbery. The two men had admitted to killing Billy's grandfather, Thurman Martin, but claimed it was in self-defense after years of abuse. As the trial date approached, the town and the media focused all their attention on what had become known as the tomato patch killing. It's a crime that stunned all of Southeast Georgia. An entire family is now charged with the murder of the family patriarch. After weeks of searching, authorities found Martin's body last July buried right beside his house. You've got all the elements. You've got a small southern town, a family with dark secrets, and then you throw in, you know, a couple of tomato plants. When I first read about the tomato patch killing, it just struck me a little bit strange. You just don't wake up one night and decide, well, let's go, let's go kill our grandfather tonight. There's got to be reasoning behind that. Jury selection began on June 16th. 59-year-old defendant John Stanton, suffering from bone cancer, arrived weak and infirm. At first you're thinking, okay, is this just something for effect? Is this some sort of, you know, courtroom drama? Once inside, Stanton's blood pressure dropped to a dangerous level, and an ambulance was called to take him to a hospital. To see them bringing him down the stairs on a stretcher, loading him up in the ambulance, you know, you're just thinking, okay, can this case get any crazier? A month later, Stanton had recovered, and on July 13th, a jury was at last selected. 
They were sequestered at the local Motel 7. The trial commenced the following day. This is not going to be a who-done-it, I don't think. This is not going to be the how to have. It's going to be gunshot wound to the back of the head. Over the next few hours, prosecutors presented the signed confessions from each of the defendants, as well as photographic and other evidence gathered at the crime scene. They urged the jury to follow the facts of the case, which they said told a simple story. All I know is that they went in, shot the man laying in the bed asleep, and that's murder. That afternoon, Billy Crowder's attorney, Hal Peel, laid out his case. The strategy was to show that Billy had been suffering from so-called battered person syndrome, and that he saw no alternative but to kill his abusive grandfather, Thurman Martin. Peel called 11 witnesses who testified to seeing Martin abuse the family. They described for the court multiple acts of violence committed against Billy Crowder and his sister, Katie. When you heard it all on the stand, one person after another after another, you know, it, it, you're thinking, okay, you know, these kids have got to be indestructible, you know, to be able to live through all of that. Katie Crowder, Martin's granddaughter, testified next. She tearfully recalled how her grandmother had endured the torments of Thurman Martin. He went to the drawer and he pulled out a big butcher knife and put it up to her throat and threatening to kill her right in front of me and my brother. While on the stand, Katie also claimed that her grandfather had tried to rape her. It was a startling allegation she had not told anyone before, not even the police investigating the murder. During cross-examination, the prosecution sought to discredit Katie's charges. The allegations of abuse just kept getting worse and worse and worse. You've already talked to the police. Uh, if this had happened, why didn't you tell them? You know, well, why are we just now hearing it? Defense attorney Hal Peel, though, had an explanation. You don't just go around making those kind of allegations about your granddaddy, you know, anywhere, but especially not in a small town like that. The next witness for the defense was the most highly anticipated, 20-year-old Billy Crowder. In a matter-of-fact tone, Crowder gave the court first-hand accounts of the physical and psychological torment he and his family had endured for years. They made me lay my hand down on the vice, take a pair of pliers, and busted my knuckles for it. He said, you'll learn to hold it next time. To bolster both Billy and Katie's testimony, the defense called its one expert witness, psychologist Daniel Grant. They perceive they have no alternatives or a few alternatives. Grant testified that Thurman Martin's relentless abuse had at last driven the family to murder. The prosecution fought back hard in its rebuttal, arguing that Billy Crowder's battered person defense exaggerated the extent of Martin's abuse. It leads you to wonder whether it was made up. And I'm not saying all made up, but uh, it couldn't have been that bad to justify shooting him while he's laying in the bed. I mean, if you believe the abuse uh, that Billy Crowder testified to, I mean, he's walking medical history. He should be dead. The prosecution also pointed out that none of the abuse had ever been reported to authorities. On the stand, Long County Sheriff Cecil Nobles contradicted earlier defense witnesses who said that attempts had been made to alert police to the abuse. The sheriff also claimed he and Thurman Martin were not close friends. Many in the courtroom found this testimony difficult to believe. He said that he hardly knew Thurman Martin, and he was an active pallbearer at Thurman Martin's funeral. And I felt like to be an active pallbearer at a funeral, you have to know that person. Finally, the prosecution questioned why Billy, along with his sister Katie, had remained with their abusive grandfather at all. At age 19, why don't you leave the house if you're getting beat up this bad? If it had been a 14, 15 year old kid, then it might have been different. But at age 19 and a, and a healthy person, uh, I mean, you got to believe this guy's Al Capone or something to be that scared. Following Billy Crowder's testimony, John Stanton took the stand to claim that he too had suffered Thurman Martin's abuse 
and had acted out of self-defense when he participated in the killing. While everyone's attention remained focused on the murder charges facing Crowder and Stanton, it was on the less serious, almost forgotten count of armed robbery that their fate would hinge. For two days in July 1998 in Ludowisi, Georgia, a jury had heard testimony in the trial of Billy Crowder and John Stanton. The two were accused of murdering family patriarch Thurman Martin, who they claimed had abused them for years. A third person, Jason Jordan, had already been convicted of murder for his role in the crime. Prosecutors now turned to one of the other charges facing the men, armed robbery, a charge Billy Crowder's attorney, Hal Peel, had thus far paid little attention to. I was worried more about, the, uh, about getting this kid off of a murder charge than I was about an armed robbery charge. I thought there is no way that a jury will find him guilty of armed robbery because in my way of thinking, you can't armed rob a dead man. The charge had been added after Billy Crowder mentioned to police that he had taken his grandfather's wallet following the murder. Once the testimony came out that this was money that Billy had supposedly earned, I think that's where a lot of people looked at it and said, you know, don't, this charge doesn't add up. Why is it, why is it here? Still, prosecutors pushed ahead, making their case that armed robbery had in fact occurred. Armed robbery in Georgia is defined as taking property uh, from the person or the immediate presence of another person through the use of an offensive weapon. Whether they're dead or not first, that's still armed robbery. As the trial drew to a close, everyone in town seemed to have an opinion. It was wrong what I, what I heard, the allegations of abuse. It was wrong for that to have happened, but they, they shouldn't have took the law in their own hands. That unless it's self-defense, I don't think murder is ever justified. Either you felt like they were guilty, horrible people, or they had killed a guilty, horrible person themselves. Defense attorneys say they provided more than enough evidence that Thurman Martin held his family in a reign of torture and terror, but it will be up to a jury to decide whether or not murder was their only method for escape. In Ludowisi, I'm Dow Kennedy. Jury deliberations began on July 16th. 1998. It was uh, really hard for some of the members of the jury because some of them came up in abusive families and they were, I think, seeing themselves. After nearly six hours, the jury came back with their verdicts. They found 59-year-old John Stanton guilty of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. John Stanton's verdict, we didn't spend that much time on it. He didn't grow up under the abuse that Billy did. He was older, he was grown up. I think he had a, a choice and he could have made a different choice. To Billy Crowder though, the jury showed sympathy. When the, the verdict was read and it was guilty of manslaughter, I just, I was, you know, I knew I felt a great relief. Though they had acquitted Billy of the more serious charge of murder, Jim Sherling recalls that he and his fellow jurors had trouble with the count of armed robbery. True, they used a weapon to kill the man, but he was already dead. They didn't use a weapon to, to rob him. So we, we didn't really think it was armed robbery. But based on the definition of armed robbery in Georgia, the jury felt they had no other choice than to find him guilty. Relieved that he had escaped the murder conviction, Billy Crowder now listened as the judge handed down his sentence. They read five years manslaughter. I'm like, well, five years ain't so bad. Do four, be out. But then came the armed robbery charge. The sentence, life in prison. Now just numb, huh? Blank. How can you get a life sentence for armed robbery for the first time offense? The sentence, the maximum allowable under Georgia law, shocked nearly everyone in the courtroom. I suppose that in the judge's mind, that equaled the playing field so that my guy who did pull the trigger, who was not convicted of murder, would get the same sentence as the guys who, uh, who were convicted of murder. I think if anybody in that jury room had known you could get life for armed robbery, 
I think it would have been a hung jury because nobody would have wanted to convict him for that. In an extraordinary move, on July 29th, eight out of the 12 jurors filed a petition pleading with the judge to reduce Crowder's sentence. The judge, however, was not swayed. This jury did what they were supposed to. I mean, they found, you know, from the evidence, the guilt or innocence, uh, and they should not have been concerned with penalty or punishment. I don't think justice was done in this case at all. I think, I think the justice system failed Billy Crowder. He should have never, never been sent to jail for life. You know, what goes around comes around, and what uh, hopefully there'll be a, a, a happy day out of all this at some point in the future. Following the trial, residents of Ludowisi tried to put the murder behind them, and life in town returned to normal. The old Martin residence, now vacant and abandoned, stands as a reminder of the crime that shocked this quiet community. As for Billy Crowder, despite his life sentence, he still maintains he has no regrets about killing his grandfather. I don't regret he's dead. I mean, uh, I'm safe now. I don't dread to go to sleep tonight, knowing that I'm gonna wake up in hell tomorrow morning. This is not the happiest place in the world to be, you know, I mean. Also, I, do, I just don't think about it. I mean, uh, that's a part of my life. It ended that night, and I suppress it. I mean, I don't think about it. It never crosses my mind. Crowder's one-time friend and accomplice, Jason Jordan, today claims he only participated in the killing because of death threats made by Crowder and John Stanton. Jordan, however, neglected to mention this to anyone before or during his trial. In the end, we will likely never know what compelled the young man to become involved in this family affair. In June 2002, 63-year-old John Stanton died of bone cancer at a Georgia state prison. As for Billy Crowder, if nothing else changes, he will first be eligible for parole in 2012 when he is 34 years old.